So warmly welcome to all of you for day four, element four, health and safety monitoring and measuring. So far we have completed three elements, even though they look like simple, but of course uh, we discuss them in a very detailed manner. Like in the first element, if you remember, we have discussed why we should manage workplace health and safety. And in the second element, we discuss about how health and safety management systems work and what they look like. And yesterday, we had a great discussion about managing risk, especially, you know, we discuss in detail about the risk, uh, you know, the people and the processes, and most importantly, the risk assessment. And today, we have health and safety monitoring and measuring. That means the system was established the system was implemented, even being followed, but now we truly have to monitor and measure. So, uh, you know, for this monitoring and measuring, uh, again, I would share uh, experience as an auditor, first of all. Sometime I saw a lot of uh, documentation and improvements and in terms of uh, controlling their processes in several companies. But when I ask them, how do you monitor? How do you measure the performance? Like if I'm gonna ask you, what is the performance of occupational health and safety management system of your company? So show me that performance. Even though the data is available, even though the documentation is well implemented, even people are following all policies, procedures and everything, but that data is not being evaluated because uh, once you will evaluate, then you can show this is, you know, how we are moving on and everything on a right track. Whatever KPIs or objectives we uh, define for, all are being achieved. And this is the evidence. And when I ask them, do you have management review meeting at least annually that you are collecting the whole year data department wise and all department has their coming with their performance presentations and showing to all management, top management professionals, okay, look, this is how my department is improving or bringing a lot of improvements or adding value to the business. And I noted personally, a lot of my safety friends, they are excellent safety leader but very poor in reporting. I mean, they, it's very, looks like very hard for them to report something better about them, like how they are performing, what activities like, so no log sheet is available. If, like if you're gonna ask them how many things you are performing every day, are you logging somewhere? Are you typing somewhere? Like if I ask you how many activities you have done for the last one year, no log is there. Yes, they have diary, but that diary can't be evaluated. When I ask them how many activities or steps you have taken to implement, let's take an example of a risk assessment procedure or how many uh, activities you have done just to ensure better safety inspections every day. So what I mean is they are doing a lot of things but not recording properly and unable to report when the management asks, because ultimately at the end of the year, they have to decide either to give you the increment, give you the promotion, yes or no. So they will ask, you know, a lot of things from your side. Show us that you are, you have achieved your personal KPIs, even, not only department wise, even your personal, like if you are a safety manager, prove us that you have achieved agreed KPIs, key performance indicators, which you have agreed with us before starting of 2021. Let's take an example. So show us, prove us that all KPIs are achieved. So how are we gonna prove through documentation, through data analysis? And that data analysis mostly is missing. What I mean is they have data available, but in shape of diaries, in shape of uh, uh, might be something in mind also that this is how we are performing. <clears throat> so, 
if you are excellent professional and doing a lot of things but not reporting professionally or effectively uh, don't expect a lot of promotions or a lot of increments let me share one live experience one of my friend you know he was uh, brilliant all the way and uh, you know even busy at home just for the sake of company that he was very much committed to that company you know but the greatest fault no 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 the terrible fault as per my opinion was whenever he work at home and working on different silent projects like developing some training plans some auditing plans or kind of things you know or supporting and preparing some reports for customers especially at home nobody was familiar from top management that how much efforts is applying even in his personal time you know i repeat again he was doing a lot of things especially at home in the office of course eight hours he was very much productive but still working a lot of it because he was the only safety leader for that company and the biggest fault he never reported how many things he is doing at home even for the sake of company to keeping this safety performance at excellent stage you know or even at level and when the time came and he started getting hurt that company is not considering him for any increment for any sort of further promotion so then i asked him several questions and one of the question i asked do you do something at home for your company he told i do a lot of things even i i visit contractors you know and after the duty sometimes just to audit them just to inspect them then i asked have you reported ever to the top management that you are doing a lot of things at home and the answer was no so then i told him this is the reason you are not getting any sort of a promotion or increments you know because they don't know they know you are doing a regular job and that's ordinary job it's not like so much uh, important in their eyes but the key things you are performing at home which you didn't report to anyone so i'm encouraging to all of you if you are doing something something for your company even you know uh, preparing any sort of uh, report even at home somebody somebody from top management must be familiar that how you are adding value to your company because once they're going to measure your individual performance your department's performance as well so the data must highlight that you are doing excellent but if if we are not keeping the data big fault if we are not evaluating that data again you know we can't measure either our kpis are being achieved or not so that is why this element is also very much important like health and safety monitoring and measuring now sometime our customer they are very clever they can ask okay send us your health and safety you know performance for the last 3 years or maybe one year now if we have data available everywhere a lot of formats are implemented let's take an example of first aid injuries but nobody is recording that's number one if they are recording then it's not being uh, uh, evaluated so how are you going to tell to customer this is our injury graph or this is our accident graph or this is our uh internet training graph as well that per month these are the trainings we have done how are you going to show how many internal audits you have conducted how many safety inspections you have conducted how many safe hours you have achieved so all these what i mean is we all are doing a lot of things but if we are uh, poor in reporting don't expect the promotions or increments you know because what we what we thought is automatic process no no it's not automatic process we have to prove look mr businessman we are adding value for your business and this is the objective evidence in shape of analysis so let's discuss uh, <clears throat> sorry element 4 health and safety monitoring and measuring as per nibosh theories 
<coughs> so we have uh, uh, key learning objectives of this element. We're going to discuss some of the common methods and indicators to use to monitor the effectiveness of uh, management systems. And everywhere you are observing the word effectiveness. That means systems are everywhere. Every company has some what level of a safety system. But what we truly have to measure the effectiveness, how effectively it is implemented or being monitored or being improved even. Then second learning objective is uh, explain why and how indicators should be investigated, recorded and reported. Explain what an audit is and why and how they are used to evaluate a management system. Now, audits, we have uh, internal audits, we have second party audits from our customer side, and we have third party audits also. And then you can consider kind of your daily safety inspections is also kind of a uh, daily audit, in other words, because it will also give you some observations for improvement or kind of opportunities for improvement. The next objective is explain why and how regular reviews of health and safety performance are needed. As per Nibosh theories, we will learn from this uh, element four. You know, these regular reviews, like if you have a safety committee, are they reviewing safety performance every month? weekly, daily, or quarterly, or biannual, or annually, you know. When you are reviewing that your safety system is improving every day and going on the right track, we will learn in this element. So let's start, uh, first of all, <clears throat> the active and reactive monitoring. Now, Active monitoring is uh, looking at control measures to see if they're correct and being used before accidents are caused. This is called active monitoring. Okay, we will keep an eye on the controls, whatever we implemented against any hazard, against any risk. We will be definitely evaluating either the control measures and the control measures could be engineering control, could be administrative, could be the PPs. So we have to check, you know, uh, these uh, control measures and then observe either they are on the right track, they are cracked and being used before accident. So it's kind of a proactive approach, right? Anything you are doing to avoid incident and accident or trying hard not to face any accident. So that means you are proactive. Proactively, you are doing risk assessment. Proactively, you are ensuring housekeeping. Proactively, you are giving training to your employees. Proactively, you are making sure the contractors are also playing their role. Proactively, you are showing that the PPs are well provided in advance and nobody is facing any sort of issue while he is starting his job. Otherwise, there is another one, we call it reactive. That means you waited for accident, once accident happened, now you are taking some actions. Of course you have to, and it's a legal requirement as well. But it's a reactive approach, which must be discouraged, you know, because prevention is better than cure. So reactive using accident and incident and ill health data to highlight areas of concern. In one of the company, I asked the gentleman, can you show me your first aid record? And he showed me bonanza of big files, you know, look, sir, we are, uh, you know, we have uh, entered every entry. And the shocking point was, mostly the headache, the backbone, muscle pain, you know, the leg pain, even uh, fever, you know, a lot of uh, first aid and some hand injuries like cuts. 
and I ju just focused on headache because every month that you know in the data later on I asked them to show me in graph if you have evaluated and he showed me in Excel and this headache every month was going up and up. Then I have a right to ask him, you know, what, how how you focused on this headache? How you why is going up actually? Why you're not taking any actions? Even though it's a reactive approach. So then he mentioned the company management is not willing to put big exhaust fans, you know, because there is a suffocation. The area is uh, occupied with more than fifty machines. And the machines are also creating noise, some several fumes going in the air. Ventilation is very poor. And that is why people mostly are complaining about headache. But company management, they are not willing to invest, even though we propose, we suggested them. So that means the safety starts from the design. If a building is designed poorly and later on constructed in a poor manner, what safety we are talking about? If a site layout not designed according to the international safety best practices, what safety we are talking about? So we have to avoid from reactive approach. Even though it's not easy, I'm telling you, especially, you know, in our developing countries, even Saudi Arabia is much, much better than, I mean, every day uh, we are improving. And our companies are realizing, yes, we can't play with safety. They have realized we can play with everything, but if you're going to play with safety, it's a killing point for the business, for our employees, for assets of the company. So now they started realizing. And thanks to social media also, because that is another threat. If something would happen within four minutes, one video viral, gone viral through the world, it's all over. Within four minutes, one video can viral through the world. So it's a huge punching or wake up call punch for the businesses, for even for the individuals even. Be on track and do your job honestly. So if you are learning something from your accident, incidents, or ill health data and highlighting the areas of concerns, still, still something is better than nothing. Instead, you are having accidents or incidents, God forbid, but you didn't learn any lessons. And, you know, one time incident or accident is kind of an opportunity for improvement. But if the same incident happening over and over again and again within the same department or on the same process, then it's terrible. I repeat again, one time incident or near miss still is an opportunity for improvement. But if same near miss, same injuries, same incident happening on the same processes, then it's your willingness, that you, it's your carelessness, it's your irresponsible behavior. And it's a legal violation as well that you are not committed to safety while you have signed safety policy and published everywhere. But your accident graph going up and up. What I mean is, still it's a good deal if you learn from your accidents a lot of lessons and make sure they're not repeating up because you have taken a lot of corrective preventive actions. So I hope uh, it will give you some idea uh, how, how we can be active safety leader as well, rather than reactive safety leader. So the industry is also looking for active safety leaders, you know, who can presume and assess the risk in advance and put the controls so they can bring the chances at a very low level of any incident or accident. Now, for active monitoring, measure conformance or non-conformance with standards, 
like number and quality of risk assessments against plan, health and safety training to schedule, consultative committee meetings to schedule, workplace inspection to schedule. So risk assessments, training, meetings, and inspections. There are four pillar of active monitoring. And I hope you remember yesterday I told, as a safety leader, risk assessment our, is our foundational corner store to start our job even. Even if I'm joining Sadara, the first document, not the policy only, I will ask, can you give me your risk assessment? Because within the risk assessment, you have elaborated everything all your hazards, all risks, who might be harmed, what is the rating, what are the current controls, later on how much uh, existing, you know, the extra controls you put in place, and what is the current risk rating of that particular activity or process. So this document will give me a very handsome picture of your system, either you are proactive or reactive. Now, health and safety training to schedule, it's another indicator. Consultative committee meetings to schedule and workplace inspections. And for the inspections, I'm personally encouraging to the safety leaders, don't tell that you will inspect every day, nine o'clock. Don't fix even your time of inspection. You know, people are very clever. The moment they will evaluate the safety manager or this officer or supervisor, he will be visiting at nine o'clock every day. So they will benchmark your time and they'll benchmark and calculate how many minutes you spend for this uh, inspection actually. And they'll be very much responsible, but only for those minutes. And once you will go back to your office, they have their own independence, you know. That is why unannounced inspections don't fix the time. Make sure every day with the rotation of 5, 10, 20 minutes, even though they will judge that strategy also, but still it will be helpful, inshallah. Now, safety inspections, sampling and tours. Now for safety inspections, examination of workplace, statutory inspection, plant and machinery, pre-use checks, usually done by one line manager or a competent person. Again, it's a terrible debating point in the companies, what I evaluated. No, no, safety inspections must be done only by the safety officers, you know or the safety inspectors, or the safety technicians. Yes, they are responsible for inspections and they'll be doing it. But the first inspection of your home, of your department must be done from your side, rather than waiting for the safety technician or the safety inspector to come and inspect and find out a lot of uh, areas for improvement. First, you check your home, you accept the ownership and then wait for others. You know. Then safety sampling, a representative sample to judge compliance and uh, less time consuming also. Instead of auditing everything or having inspection of every nook and corner, you, you sampleize because otherwise you can't do anything else. And in one of the company I noted they have safety ins inspectors, separate position and every day their job is just to wander everywhere and find out the opportunities for improvement and report in shape of, like they'll inspect all ACs, they'll, they'll inspect everything actually. And they're trained for it. They have no other job. They'll do inspection, fill the forms and report back to the safety manager or safety supervisor. And then they are the one suggesting for the, some actions, you know, and mostly they were having one-to-one -one meeting with that relevant department. Because they have done inspection, now they will call 
the relevant department head one to one they agree how to move on and improve the areas otherwise the safety tour a high profile walk around inspection in workplace carried out by group including senior managers the intention is to interact and be highly visible i repeat again and this is the opportunity for the top management to lead by example by having safety tour you know because it's a high profile walk around inspection in a workplace carried out by a group including senior managers the intention is to interact and be highly visible if leadership is not visible at site a terrible impact because that would highlight they are not serious they are not committed because they are not visiting the site even for a single time for the last 3 months now uh, let me dare to ask you how your top management is in you know, how frequently they conduct safety tours you know if i ask about your uh, president board members managing director ceo or in other words the general manager of sadara of different projects or even the project managers how frequently or what is the schedule for safety tours you know do they do it or they just rely on the subordinates because as per the international standards you now the top management have to get involved and lead by example they have to be the front leader you know of that project of that company they can't run away by sitting in their own office and never visit any site so now how sadara top management is supporting their projects you know and that would be great support for you also because you guys are doing excellent everywhere you are moving and improving but how top management is uh, supporting you through safety tours so i'm open to this discussion how sadara top management is involved yes please Yes, guys. Uh, I'm waiting for your opinion. How the top management is excellent. You know that is why I'm mentioning again and again. You, you guys are the role model even for the market, Marshall. you know if any company want to improve he should request and have a visit of sadara projects and companies and they would have great ideas how to how to manage how to implement a safety system you know excellent mashallah and still mr abdul aziz uh, even ceo by i mean two visits per year still is a good thing i mean because still is leading by example so he would have data you know the live data how things are moving around excellent mashallah you know if uh, you are a owner of a business or you have any company 
you must visit some of the best companies and you can have a lot of ideas how you can implement and improve your company as well okay now there are some sort of uh, systematic inspections like plant machinery vehicles machinery and vehicles and premises workplace and environment people work methods and behavior procedures safe systems permit to work so that means tetra p's or four p's is kind of a systematic inspection you know like you first target the plant means all machines and vehicles then the premises mean the workplaces and environment then you focus on people like working methods and behavior now this behavior now here uh, i can create one question have you ever announced the best safest behavior holder of the month any employee have you announced even for annual just because of behavior because surely sadara would have a rewarding environment you know if someone is uh, having safest behavior you might have encouraging them through reward or certificate or something like that only for behavior i'm talking about maybe maybe in each department you will find two or three or five gentlemen <clears throat> and they have excellent behavior towards safety systems you know and they don't violate any safety regulations no unsafe act because of them they always encourage others also to follow safety just because of their behavior if you are not doing this no harm to encourage to your hr or your safety leadership let's evaluate only the behavior and find out the best employee of the month or best employee of the year just because of safest behavior what i mean is find some role models and share with others and this is how sometime we have to encourage other people you know so i repeat again four p's is a systematic inspection way out like plant premises people and procedures for plant our focus must be machinery and vehicles and for premises all workplaces every nook and corner of the company and the environment and people mean the working methods and the behavior and procedures mean the safe systems and permits to work now arrangements for active monitoring for active monitoring there must be some arrangements like factors to consider when planning the introduction of active monitoring like type of monitoring required what would be the frequency we'll do it one inspection per day or what would be the frequency you know allocation of responsibilities who will do it how are you going to do it what are the key responsibilities of uh, those uh, active monitors or inspectors or auditors competence of the inspector is critically important we need the competent inspector for sure and use of checklist 
But the checklist, you know, the problem with the checklist, even though we have tick, tick, tick all options, but the variables are missing. <clears throat> any variance or any kind of variables, mostly they are not highlighted. So here, here you can use your experience, your kind of understanding and go deeper, you know, to understand if there are any further variables instead of just Tick, 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 that all, everything is good. Now, action planning for problems found. Let me share one live example again. In one of the company, I asked the forklift operator, can you show me your uh, last 90 days or three months daily inspection record of only forklift number 009. And the moment I shuffled up, even all pages I couldn't check, but randomly. And the shocking point was 100% ticks, that everything is okay. The tick was in, in the okay column. All cells were ticked with okay, that no problem with that for the last, even though. I repeat again, I didn't check all 90 pages, but random selection, you know, kind of a sample. And within that sample, all the pages were highlighting that everything is okay. Then I asked the gentleman, how come everything is okay for the last 90 days of your forklift? Don't you have any problem with your forklift? So he confidently he mentioned no. So then I asked him, you know, can you can we can we just have one more inspection and I'll be with you? You know, his confidence shredded up and on his side it's all okay, but still if you want to visit, okay, no problem. And the moment I checked their forklift, first of all, the safety belt was not buckling up. I still remember the tire quality. Tire's quality was terrible. Even the forks were wobbling up, you know, and having some temporary solutions, not to fell down, not to broke out. The paint of the forklift was highlighting, especially the scratches, how many times they have hit to the pillars or to the walls or to the machines even, because normally they don't report. If something happened, you are the one going to catch them, otherwise they don't report. They always try to hide because they know it will punish them for sure, you know. Then I asked him, how come you can take, 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 and even some leaking was also there. So how come you can take everything? Do you know what you're taking? Sorry, sir, I don't know English. That was his answer. Then why you are taking? That's what the safety department told me, just take, take, take and send me every day, you know, one Xerox copy to us and one keep with you. And the problem with that is if you're not highlighting in report, the maintenance team will not do anything. They'll be enjoying because the reports are the key evidence that everything is okay. So maintenance department, they'll not bother about if they would highlight or oh, tires quality is not good or the folks are terribly damaged or safety belt is not buck buckling up. Definitely the procurement of the maintenance, they will try to call third party maintenance company or maybe internal maintenance teams, you know, so they'll correct it. But if it is not reported in written, because based on your inspection, you will create a work order for maintenance. But if it is all take 100% is okay, then you have no option to create a work order for maintenance. What I mean is, if you have inspections must be effective. And for every checkbox, you have to stop and evaluate. And see honestly, if it is perfectly done, then tick. Because your wrong takes means you, you are the killer. Anytime might be something can happen. 
because even though you take everything is okay but if you do this inspection honestly that means you are supporting to everyone in the company not only to the people even ss of the company you know because proactively the company management would get a wake up call that these areas we have to improve they required some maintenance they required some overhauling they required some you know kind of uh, focus to improve might be a uh, overall uh, now housekeeping of that area that would also be highlighted because in the inspe inspection checklist or safety inspection you have a lot of points and one of the point you'll get the housekeeping of that area it is okay not okay or required for the improvement because based on these checklists your action planning will be done if the problems found you know Now let's take some examples of inspection system. Bank head office is there. What is the purpose? Monitoring health and safety standards. Frequency for this bank head office, you have monthly. Competence is one day course. Persons responsible, managers at different levels. Inspection checklist, general checklist, tailored if required. Follow up arrangements, yes, an action plan is required. now you have a group exercise list the topic headings that should be included in an inspection checklist for use in your workplace design a rough format for the inspection check sheet so what you can do is just highlight in the chat box the inspection points for a confined space let's select the restricted areas one example only consider is a confined space so please highlight the key areas or key points which you need to check i mean just to prepare the checklist for that particular confined space what things you going to add in the inspection checklist for confined space i repeat again inspection points for a confined space which we need to highlight in the checklist because that is your group exercise so since we are not face to face so what we can do is in the chat box everyone can highlight one two points or whatever you consider must be there in the confined space checklist mm -hmm. okay so mr abdulaziz you mentioned the ducts yes oxygen efficiency ventilation great mashallah rescue plan lighting and much better approach is we must prepare safety inspection checklist area wise instead of having a very lengthy inspection checklist and even the inspector is bother and he's just taking taking because if the points are more than 500 different points and inspection sheet having 10 different pages individually he will be fed up so if you if you chop up the elephant again you know department wise area wise location wise or machine wise even and you you get a safety team member from each department and let them check by themselves and you visit 
the moment you have a, a site tour visit and you start collecting inspection checklists from each department and you review also you just double check that they, they didn't take anything you know wrongly or they didn't hide anything so just you review and move on to the next department instead of doing everything by yourself because ultimately if we want to create a safety culture we have to make habitually uh, you know uh, i would say uh, to get their focus of each employee that their safety is their responsibility so they must inspect their area their department means their responsibility so they should check that nothing is uh, unsafe nothing is bad within their department and the checklist is there they can tick 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 sign it up and you can review it you can double check some of the points if you believe there is a need otherwise move on to the next department because self done is well done if you are coming to my office so i should have safety inspection checklist for my office and this is my first job to double check that no electrical issue is there no naked wire no broken switches you know i have no problem within my office housekeeping is good so what i am doing i'm checking everything and you are the one reviewing it rather than you are coming and spending maybe 30 45 minutes and later on making my mind that safety is your responsibility you are the one doing everything you know you have to do it what i mean is my home first of all must be inspected by myself and in our safety procedures no harm to mention that line so uh, this is how we can create a better seriousness even though uh, some department they will not agree if we will be doing inspection then what safety department will do safety department basically is a service department is a support is advisory department you know but unfortunately if safety department is doing everything then the others are totally unaware and others are totally out of the safety culture because their mindset is well developed that safety is the responsibility of only safety team members while the international standards clearly says your responsibility first of all your responsibility so i hope it will give you some ideas how that safety inspection must move on with effectiveness so typically these are some of the topics of generic inspection checklist like fire safety you can have a separate checklist housekeeping environmental issues that is why we have <clears throat> even though we have environmental aspects and impacts and some environmental engineer now project to projects available so we can coordinate and we can tell them uh, verify have a checklist and give one xerox copy to us also but you double check that he is doing his inspection honestly and same with the traffic rules chemical safety machinery safety electrical welfare facilities as well and in one of the company let me share the experience in one of the company i noted almost checklist for everything checklist for generator checklist for compressors checklist for fire extinguishers checklist for first aid boxes checklist for uh, this uh, eye washers checklist for machines checklist for confined spaces even for chemical storage areas even checklist for warehouse you know checklist for fire hydrant system overall checklist for sprinkler separate i noted you know i mean it's up to you how you want to move on with your inspection methodologies but area wise department wise location wise or process wise would be more beneficial inshallah now let's talk about reactive monitoring before that all methods we discuss is all about active monitoring that means you are proactive now let's talk about reactive monitoring because you are learning from your 
accidents incidents ill health other unwanted events and even situations so accident incident ill health or other unwanted events and situations means highlights areas of concern things that have already gone wrong and may as what the failures and we have two lessons two methods one we will get the lessons from one specific event like an accident and data collected over a period so we keep following up that there isn't any possibility of that accident to be repeated so all our preventive actions or kind of corrective actions no harm to follow up and make sure sustainability is there no reactive monitoring that means you need to collect the data about accidents dangerous occurrences and near misses now here again let me share some practical issues there are several near misses but our employees are not trained how to report or intentionally the culture has developed not to report if a forklift has hit to the machine little bit and there is a possibility of uh, asset uh, you know damage he will not report he will try his level best to hide it same way if something fell down from the scaffolding platform and nothing no one is injured and nobody he will not report that the tow board was missing or you know or the tow board was not fixed properly or they were doing some horse play so that's why the equipment fell down or the pipe fell down or any tool fell down even though no property damage no person had any accident but these near misses mostly are not being reported so that means a lot of unreported near misses are there even unreported minor injuries are a lot like someone have cut because of sharp edge maybe on any tool or machine or anywhere he will not report because the bandage is already in his pocket he will take a wrap up and start hiding and later on wearing you know because he missed to wear the gloves and later on now he will wear the gloves also so unreported accident incidents or kind of uh, near misses or unsafe acts or unsafe conditions unreported it's a terrible issue for the companies and it's really hard to encourage our employees because everyone is different so it's really hard to bring them on one way agenda please report it's not a blame shame game you know if you will not report who will even think to improve so same way there must be some analysis like uh, over the period of uh, time you know time to time worker complaints and also pattern like horse cost for certain enforcement actions type like injuries so all these data must also be evaluated and analyzed like see in the picture in graphical presentation you can analyze the data now still is a reactive monitoring we are discussing so loss time accident frequency rate there is a formula loss time accidents per 100000 hours work like number of loss time accident during a specific time period and number of hours worked over the same period and you can multiply with 100000 and you will get loss time accident frequency rate per 100000 hours work and mostly this formula either we have a software for safety data analysis or reporting or otherwise we are using excel and in the excel pre defined formulas are there you just put the data and automatically is being calculated now once we understood the active monitoring and reactive monitoring now is time to investigate recording and reporting incident to discuss in 4.2 element 
Why, what are the reasons for investigation? And why investigations are important, you know? First of all, we truly have to identify the immediate root causes, the immediate root causes and prevent reoccurrence, collect and record evidence, legal reasons, insurance purposes, staff morale, disciplinary purposes, and data gathering. We have to do investigations. Now, of course, I'll not share the name of that company or the name of that gentleman, but let me share this practical issue also. I got one call from a safety manager of one of the biggest group in Saudi Arabia. And he was having some trembling voice, I would say. And he mentioned, look, sir, I attended some Nibosh training with you, like Nibosh PSM. So I just need your one support. OK, go ahead. No problem. Just share with me. So he mentioned the top management is enforcing me, pushing me hard, that don't report that accident. One guy was died at the site. So they are enforcing me and putting a lot of pressure not to report this case to Gosi and share it is just like a sudden death at home. So what should I do? <clears throat> No, I have a same similar question to all of you. If you get such kind of pressure from your top management, don't report that accident to the government officials or in GOSI system, you know. What would be your reaction? What would be your reply to them? I'm opening this discussion for all of you. Like, there is an accident and the person is died at the site, but the top management is saying don't report and show, show this incident or accident as a sudden death or he slipped off, hit to the wall, hit to something at home, not at site. If that kind of negative pressures you are getting, God forbid, from your top management, how, how would you respond to them actually? Your response against not to report accident to go see or to government. What would be your response, guys? It's a little bit sensitive subject, but I really want to put up because I told you now we have to share our experiences. And this is how we are getting scenario from Nibosh and in line with the scenario, we'll be giving all answers. Take your time. So Mr. Yusuf, excellent, mashallah. So you mentioned you will report no matter what. Okay, excellent. Any other opinion, please? Mr. Yusuf has required a lot of guts to be dareful in front of the top management. I truly appreciate that you are not, uh, you know, compromising with your ethical values or kind of your honesty you required for your job. Okay, Mr. Ahmad, you are going with the same uh, statement of Mr. Yusuf. So Mr. Muhammad Al Gamdi, always reporting. Great, mashallah. So now what I replied to that gentleman, first of all, who told you not to report? He mentioned he's one of the director. 
So then I requested him, first of all, send him an official email or even call him back and tell him, can you send me in writing through email? So I'll follow your instructions. Even though it's illegal, not reporting accident is an illegal offense and terrible offense, I would say. And what I guided him, whoever is trying to push pressures, tell him to push that pressure in writing, first of all. And secondly, you should never compromise with your honesty because if later on something uh, evaluated by the doctor in the hospital and they found it's not home based, it's the person has died maybe three hours before somewhere at the site, or maybe they could have uh, employees interviews or something like that. So if today or tomorrow that case to be highlighted, you'll be in jail. You'll be behind the bars, you know, because then top management will say, no, 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 he is the, he's the safety manager. He's responsible. Why he didn't report? He reported us that it's a home base, sudden death. Not an accident, accidental death at the site, you know. And secondly, I mentioned the same thing, no matter what, you must report it. And don't delay, by the way, because there is a time frame as per the league, you, know, you have to report within 24 hours, internally and externally, and report it properly. And also keep your resignation in your pocket also. Because there are millions of companies. You will get new job. But once you lost your credibility as a safety professional, and if a management is blackmailing today, they will be keeping you blackmailed for next years also. Whenever, <clears throat> whenever they want to push any pressure, they'll say, okay, don't report, hide this one. So be bold and report no matter what. And then he reported and, you know, he ignored all the instructions. Even uh, I wrote one email and I told, send this email in CC to all your directors. First report them that this incident has happened. And in response to that email, let me see who will reply. And none of the directors replied, by the way. Because orally they were putting pressure, but in writing, nobody want to be the culprit you know, in writing. And also I told him, you know, if a person is died at sight, why you want to kill his family more, you know, because ultimately you'll get some amount from GOSI or some insurance companies. So their family, you know, his family at least can have some fruit later on. Otherwise, if you report it's a sudden death at home, it's a terrible injustice with his family also. And Alhamdulillah, he followed the same thing and nothing would happen, you know. Still he's working there. And now having more respect, might be sometimes the top management, they will just check or judge. You never know what is going in their minds, you know. But anyhow, they were... Uh, Terrible minds, by the way, putting unnecessary pressure. And from that day, he, he asked me, you know, now I keep one copy of resignation, mostly in my WhatsApp, somewhere in my pocket even, in printed format, because I will not compromise. Because it's illegal. Otherwise, what's the benefit to hire a safety manager? <clears throat> And also you will miss an opportunity to improve. If you will not consider this an accident, that means you will not investigate. So you are losing an opportunity to improve. So this accident can repeat again because no actions, no preventive actions, nothing has happened there. So there are uh, different types of incidents like accident, near miss, dangerous accidents, work related ill health. A and D W like accident, near miss, dangerous occurrence, work related ill health. <clears throat> now let's understand the definition. Like, what is the definition of accident? What is definite? Like, what is uh, meaning of accident actually? So it's kind of an unplanned, 
unwanted even nobody likes accidents nobody wants accident and nobody plan the accidents also so an unplanned unwanted even which leads to injury damage or loss injury accident where the unplanned unwanted even lead to some sort of personal injury e.g. a cut hand damage only accident where the unplanned unwanted even leads to equipment or property damage but not personal injury and the wall is demolished near miss an unplanned unwanted event that had the potential to lead injury damage or loss but did not in fact do so and near miss is, is an excellent opportunity to take some preventive corrective actions and make sure even the near miss is not going to be repeat again that means you are minimizing or eliminating the possibility of upcoming accident or incident i repeat again if you are taking actions against near misses you are reducing the possibilities of future incidents that is why the unreported near misses is a terrible issue within the companies and in our toolbox meetings in our regular safety meetings in our trainings we must convince people please report learn to report about near misses for their safety not dangerous occurrence is a specified event that has to be reported to the relevant authority by such a law or a major gas leak it's a dangerous occurrence because it will uh, of course give a terrible consequences to the nearby community to the cities if any major gas leak is there so you, it's a dangerous occurrence so we have to report to the relevant authorities now work related ill health a disease or medical condition that is directly attributable to work it is dermatitis or as a result of exposure to skin irritants skin allergy or anything happened just because of some of the operational fumes of that machine or maybe that area or maybe from confined space or maybe a reaction because of different chemicals in now what should be the level of investigation the minimal level is immediate line manager and not excessive time or effort low is the line manager perhaps with some support and more time and effort involved medium is the middle manager with support and significant time and effort and high means the senior management oversight with team based approach and significant time and effort is required so four levels of investigations are there minimal low medium and high but in high the senior management should also be get involved now we have group discussion discuss the first thing you should do when arriving at any accident scene and then the later step so let's open this question in the chat box discuss the first thing you should do when arriving at accident scene and then the later steps <clears throat> okay steps of accident investigation scene like mr rahman you mentioned we must report it okay that should be your first step any opinion any other opinion please any other opinion please <clears throat> oh 
Okay, so gather all feedback from people. Was there? Okay. Anything else, please? Gather information and report it. I'm repeating again, discuss the first thing you should do when arriving, when arriving at an accident scene and then the later steps. Like you mentioned, report it, gather information, gather all feedback from people who was there. Or you will secure the scene first. Like you'll barricade and no one, no one can approach to that area. Or the first thing you'll make sure to get some information and report it. But ultimately reporting is more critical. It must be reported. And scene should also be secured that no one else can approach to that area, any unauthorized, irrelevant persons. So now these are basic investigation procedures. Safety of uh, the scene, is the area safe to approach? That's why the barricade and you know, is immediate action needed to eliminate danger before casualties are closed? And if the casualty care is there, the first aid treatment, hospitalization, also consider bystanders who may be in shock. So first thing is the safety of the scene. Secondly, casualty care. So what is the step one? Gather factual information, like you mentioned, mashallah. And step two is analyze the information and draw conclusions. Step three, identify suitable control measures. And step four is plan the remedy actions. I repeat again, these are the basic investigation procedure steps. Number one is collect the information, but factual information. Step two, analyze the information and draw conclusions. And three is identify suitable control measures like corrective preventive actions as per the hierarchy of control. Step four, plan the remedial actions, so it will not repeat again. So these are four steps for basic investigation procedure. Now, if Nibosh have given a scenario and one incident happened and later on they are talking about something about the investigation. And if in the scenario, if you believe these four steps are not followed, then don't agree with that uh, scenario investigation, you know. Later again, you can go and debate in your answer and say, if the question is, was the investigation was sufficient against this accident in line with the scenario, you have to answer. So if the investigation is not sufficient, the points what they highlighted in the scenario, go and debate and don't agree and tell, yes, investigation done is a good thing, but a lot of missing steps are there or the falling missing steps as per Nibosh IGC theories is not considered or not followed. Now let's discuss all steps like gathering information. The first step is secure the scene. Like I mentioned, you have to make your no irrelevant unauthorized persons can approach. So better barricade, have a red barrier tape or any other way. Identify witnesses, collect factual information, interview witnesses, examine documents. So this is step one, gathering information. Secure the scene, identify witnesses, collect factual information, interview witnesses, examine documents. So in step one, we have five sub steps. I repeat again, secure the scene, identify witnesses, because in most of the scenarios, surely they will put one accident incident and investigation, once accident is there, of course, one question, 
somehow you need to answer for investigations also. Now secure the scene, identify witnesses, collect factual information, interview witnesses and examine documents. No, witness interview techniques. If you are going to interview the witness, what is the technique? As per Nibosh theories, like you must have a quiet or quiet room, no distractions, establish a rapid and explain the purpose, not about blaming or shaming, and use the best trick of open questions like who, what, where, when, why, how. Use open questions and keep an open mind, take notes, ask for a written statement and thank the witness. This is one technique of interviewing the witness. And most important is who, what, where, when, why, how. Try to get the answers of these five W's and one H. And document examination is uh, you can check the company policy, the risk assessments, training records, safe system of work, different kind of procedures, in other words, the permits to work, maintenance records, previous accident reports, sicknesses, absence record. So you can have document examination just to double check and collect maximum information to investigate that incident. Now that was all about step number one. Now let's talk about step two. Because now we have plenty of information. It's time to analyze that information. Like what are the immediate causes? Either it's like unsafe acts or unsafe conditions. Immediate causes would be only like unsafe acts or unsafe conditions. And they are more easy to identify by the way. But the real root causes, especially the underlying root causes, here you require a lot of energy and, of course, uh, uh, some investigation, effective investigation skills also, how to dig out all the possible root causes, underlying root causes, like reasons behind the immediate causes. After often failure in the management system, like no supervision, no PP provided, no training, no maintenance, no checking or inspection. Now let's go with a group exercise. A worker is uh, struck by a load being carried on a pallet by a forklift truck. Outline possible immediate and underlying causes of the accident. The discussion is open in the chat box. Read the question above. A worker is struck by a load being carried out on a pallet by a forklift truck. Outline possible immediate and underlying causes of accident. Take your time and let me see how you identify the possible immediate and underlying causes of that in accident. Why how is important? Because possible immediate causes, it would be like within unsafe acts or unsafe conditions. But the key part of investigation is the underlying causes of accident. And here, five W's, especially the why and how will be helping you. And don't leave that why until you have all the possible underlying causes, you know, which you need to report. Like see the possible immediate causes, failure to secure the pallet, number one, maybe center of gravity is not there. Maybe poor positioning of the truck close to the pedestrian exit. Aggressive braking by the driver. Inattentive pedestrian steps into the path of the forklift. Now, possible underlying root causes, no training for the driver. Why that training was not done? Lack of segregation of vehicle, poor driver induction, poor truck maintenance, no refresh training. So I hope it will give you some clarity 
how you have to identify immediate causes and underlying causes as well. Now the step three is identifying suitable control measures. Once your investigation is done, of course, now you need immediate uh, control measures and some planned control measures for future perspective. So what are the immediate causes? Like clean up this, uh, if uh, for immediate causes, what steps we need to follow? Clean up the spill, replace the missing guard, relocate the trailing cable, and for underlying root causes, more difficult need to make changes in management system. That is why review of safety policies, procedures, training plans, daily inspection, a lot of things, you know, we need to reconsider and review to upgrade the system and make it more effective. Step four is uh, we have to plan the remedial actions like dangerous conditions must be dealt with immediately. Interim actions may be possible. Underlying causes will require more complex actions. Of course, it will take time, effort, disruption, money, need for prioritization as well, but we can prepare one kind of uh, action plan sheet like recommended action, introduce induction training for all new drivers, Priority is medium, time scale one month, responsible person, warehouse, manager. So remedial action plan must be prepared, even should be time bound, and the responsible person must also be highlighted within the plan. And later on, one column, if I'll prepare that one, we'll add one follow-up column as well. So we will follow up after one month, or even during the month, either the induction program, training programs are introduced or not yet. Now, recording and reporting requirements. The reporting is the process of informing people that an incident has occurred. Can be internally within the organization or external to the enforcement agencies. Because we don't want to let our employees morale down. So we need to update them. Oh, these are the lessons. That is why the lesson learned against any incident or accident we display on the notice boards also. Because let everybody be familiar what happened, how it was happened, what actions are being taken, and how they have to learn something from those lessons, you know. And remember, recording is the pro process of uh, documenting the event. So documentation is very much important, especially in high hazardous industries like oil and gas, mining, pharmaceutical, paper industry, and so many others. Now, what sort of things are likely to hinder good accident and near miss reporting? And what can an organization to do, do to make it more likely that incidents will be reported? How are we gonna convince, this is the greatest challenge, you know. How are we gonna convince people to report? Or what are the things, you know, they are reluctant to report. Even though we discuss a lot, but let's uh, understand the barriers to reporting. Number one is unclear organizational policy. Let me share here the experience also. Whenever during audit, we ask someone, do you know what is your safety policy? No, I don't know. Do you know where it is displayed? Yes, I know it is displayed on the notice board. It is, you know, in the frame, it's everywhere. Do you know what is written inside? No, I don't know. Do you know what is the purpose of that policy? Sorry, I don't know. So that means the policy is not understood by the employees, it's unclear, the employees are not taking it serious. And if you ask them, do you know it's zero tolerance requirement, you have to follow that policy? Sorry, I don't know. Because in the induction program or in your regular trainings, you didn't make them realize why that policy is being developed and even displayed everywhere. What is the purpose behind? And now their mindset will say, 
no, this is only being done for Saudi Aramco. This is only being done for customers. This is only being done for third party certification bodies, for auditing bodies, you know, to show them, see, policy is everywhere. And even if you remember, I told you the signatory, you can go back and ask them, have you ever studied even for a single time while you signed it? And do you know what is written inside? Mostly the answer you'll get no. We don't have time to study even our own safety policy. And also no reporting system in place, like no stop card, no red barrier, no uh, near miss reporting card, something like that. The system is not in place. Overly complicated reporting procedures. You know, everyone can create complications or everyone can make anything complicated. But making things easier, this is required some positive sound professional skills. Now, a lot of barriers are still there, like excessive paperwork, take too much time, blame culture, apathy, and also lack of training on policy and procedures. So these are the terrible barriers in reporting. Especially, I would go with blame culture. Oh, if I will report about him, he will be my enemy, you know. If I will report against him, he will find more points in my department and he will also report. So we have to convince them it's not a blame shame culture. It's a support to each other, you know. Now, it's it surely depends the reporting like on the severity, like internal directors, senior managers, human resources managers, health and safety, environmental advisors, worker participations, because this is kind of internal incident reporting. And external, we have to report to the family of the casualty, external authorities, insurance companies, and public, public relation advisors. So almost all the interested parties, all the stakeholders have to be informed. Now, the minimum standard is the accident book. And within the accident book, what exactly the informations we have to put in place, name and address of the casualty, date and time of the accident, location of accident, details of injury, details of treatment given, description of event causing injury or details of any equipment or substances involved, witnesses, that means names and contact details. You know, it's a kind of a format of accident reporting or accident log sheet, you know, detail of person completing the record and also signatures. So we can have an accident book. That is a minimum standard. No, external reportable events, some incidents need to be reported. especially to the regulator by law, for example, fatality, major injury, dangerous occurrence, disease and lost time injuries. We are legally responsible to report about fatalities, major injuries, dangerous occurrence, disease and lost time injuries. Legally, we are responsible to report. And if we don't report, it's a legal violation. Now, the next element we have auditing. Now, auditing, you know, even though it's a systematic process and we verify as per our procedures, policies and formats and make sure the system is in place and being followed the way it should be. But the problem with the auditing is we don't audit everything. It's a sample based. So sometimes it doesn't give us the true picture of the overall system, but still it's a good practice. And in auditing, we have uh, three types of auditing, like uh, the first party audits. The first party auditing means your internal auditing. 
your department wise auditing being done by your team of internal auditors so that means the audit you are doing for your company is called first party audit i repeat again the audit internally being done by your internal auditors would be considered first party audit the second party audit is your customers are sending the auditors on behalf of them they hire any auditing company and they are coming to audit your organization on behalf of your customers that would be called second party audit and even if government of saudi arabia is sending some auditors on behalf of their side again would be considered the second party audit if you as a customer sending some auditors to audit your suppliers or contractors still is a second party audit now what is the third party audit like we willingly calling any third party certification body to audit our system and certify us or uh, if we are complying with all the relevant international standards and for this reason if we believe our occupational health and safety management system is well implemented as per iso 45001 we can hire a third party certification body to audit our system and issue us globally recognized the certificate of iso 9001 2018 if everything is in line with the standard well implemented so that would be called third party audit and that third party audit could be done by different certification bodies whomsoever you have hired might be intertech sgs bbqr tuv dn we have api also started some of the audit so several certification bodies are there so you hire a certification body and sometimes customer is the one like sadara's customer gonna say your third party audit should also be done by intertech or by sts and you have no other option because customer have value for sure and once you achieve third party certification through some effective auditing and you get an evidence this evidence you can use for bidding because whenever the bidding documentation is there the customer always asks are you certified for quality management if yes attach the copy of 9001 2015 standard are you certified for environmental management system yes attach the copy of 14001 certificate same way iso 45001 for occupational health and safety management system if you are certified then send us the certificate so this is how the global certification help in bidding also so more easy to get new projects more easy to win go and apply for bidding and win the contract so three different types of audits are there internal audits mean the first party audit audit on behalf of your customers or you are sending your auditors to your contractors is a second party audit and the third party means you are hiring willingly after implementation of any international standards from iso or even product relevant and you call the third party certification body to audit your system and if everything is well issue the certificate so i hope it will give you some comprehensive clarity how many types of audits are there and most importantly what are the benefits of uh, each audit type you know like the first party audit what are the benefits 
in quick nutshell you can have a clear picture of your management systems in place all your policies procedures second party audit customer will be happy to see if everything is well in line with the international standards so he will be happy to keep continue the business with you and the third party auditing if everything is good enough and you got the certificate it will enhance your brand value in the market so a lot of other benefits are also there so let's discuss uh, the definition scope and purpose of auditing auditing is a systematic objective and critical evaluation of an organization's health and safety management system now what is the difference between an audit and an inspection i am opening this question to all of you please in the chat box what is the difference difference between an audit and an inspection whatever is coming in your mind please uh, uh, type in the chat box so let's learn from each other the difference between an audit and an inspection Take your time, please. Like Mr. Muhammad Al Ghamdi, he mentioned an inspection is a typically something that a site is required to do by a compliance obligation. An audit is the process of checking that compliance obligations have been met, and including that the required inspections have been done. excellent master any other opinion please the difference between an inspection and audit even we have discussed the types of audits and several benefits now it's time to discuss the difference and uh, personally i like mr mohammed al gamdi's definition mashallah even though nikosh will be telling something little bit different but it looks like more comprehensive to be very honest because we do day to day inspection to see either the compliance obligations are being done and audit will put a stamp that it is compliant and you know <laughs> and later on you can claim the compliance obligations are well met even though auditing is a kind of sampling activity but still very systematic and the whole system if the auditor is uh, uh, competent he will definitely find out the maximum opportunities for improvement anyhow see the difference as per nibosh the distinction between audits and inspection the uh, inspection is all about checks the workplace checks records usually quick lower cost and also may only require basic competence and parts of an audit and looks at the physical reality of the workplace so this is kind of inspection now audit it will examining the documents procedures interviews even verification of uh, different standards and also no uh, uh, there would be kind of a site tour so that means checking with the workplaces and yes it could be a long process sometimes the auditors have two man days or three man days or maybe sometimes four man days it depends on the size of the organization and usually expensive also and requires a high level of competence and looks at the management system and most importantly the which is lies on the behind this actually so this is something restriction between inspection and audit 
So inspection is more like, I would say, the day-to-day uh, -day regular checking and audit is a systematic checking, you know, that you will, and or audit is more like for system to be verified and inspection is more like to verify some records, some workplaces, and it's a quick activity because we can do it anytime, announced or unannounced. It could be our regular job even. Now let's see and understand the phases of or the steps of auditing, you know, like pre-audit preparation. If I want to conduct an audit or I got instructions from the top management, so now the first step is pre-audit preparations. And what I have to do is I need to define the time scale, scope of the audit, which area, which department, which location I'm going to audit, an area and extent of the audit, who will be required? Can I do it individually or I need some other team member? Again, it depends on the size of the organization and the complications or the complicated processes of the organization. So accordingly, we decide or we want to save some time, you know, instead of doing individually, I would request to have a few more auditors with me. So we can do it as quick as possible. Now, who will be required and what documentation will be required? So these are pre-audit preparations. Now, during the audit, what I have to do is auditors use three methods to gather information. Number one, paperwork, documents and records. Wherever I'm going as an auditor, I'm recording document number this and I'm getting one copy also and keeping the objective evidence. Whichever clause as per the standard I'm verifying, I'll keep the reference, I'm making some notes also, taking some interviews and having some observation as well like workplace equipment activities and behavior and i'll be noting down and this is a way to gather the information so three methods paperwork interviews observation okay guys so thank you very much for your reminder for the break so uh, let's meet up again at one Inshallah, thank you very much for bearing with me for your great focus and participation, Mashallah. Have a nice break, prayer and lunch break, and catch you again at one, Inshallah. Okay? So before the break, we were discussing about auditing and uh, other than Nibosh theories, uh, I shared with all of you how many types of audits are there and uh, what is their purpose behind. And most importantly, as per Nibosh theories, uh, what we have to do uh, just to prepare for the audit. And uh, now we are going to discuss during the audit what things matters a lot. and. Uh, we have PIO, that means the paperwork, interviews, and observation. These are the things as an auditor we have to do, especially to gather the information. Like paperwork, uh, the more documents and records we're going to verify, the more objective evidence we'll get. And to compare either they are complying the standards or the procedures. In internal audits, uh, mostly we audit, you know, based on the our existing SOPs or uh, kind of uh, regulations or uh, I would say whatever rules you have made for different kind of uh, restricted, restricted areas, accordingly you're gonna verify. But in external third party audits or second party audits even, customer have rights even to check the credibility of SOPs. Either the accuracy of uh, SOP is well insured or there is any gap comparing to their standards or as per international standards. But uh, mostly the internal audit, we do as per our internal SOPs. That's what I noted personally also. Now, but anyhow, the more documentation you review, the more better audit trail you're gonna have. And 
uh, I would say the maximum opportunities for improvement you can find in, inshallah. So also, interviews uh, of managers and workers helps a lot. And as an auditor, we have to be the good listener as well. The more we're going to listen, the more better picture we can have in our mind, you know, about the system actually. And uh, uh, in, in front of third party auditors, the best uh, strategy is not to speak so much because the more you're going to speak, they will create more questions, you know. Like you're going to say, oh, we do this, we do this, this is our best system, this is our best step. Okay, can you show me the evidence? You know, as an auditor, they're very clever in nature. So whatever you're talking, they're going to say, okay, show me the evidence because they will collect the evidence maximum. Even during the interview, you know, they'll find the maximum chances of improvements and based on their observation skills, Definitely, they will write a lot of observations related to workplace, equipment, activities, and behavior. And the tendency of uh, audits uh, must be based on positive grounds, like it's an opportunity to improve further, to find out the areas to improve further, rather than taking it negatively. Oh, auditor is coming, so he will uh, highlight a lot of negative things about my department. No, 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 it's a blessing. It's a blessing because your eyes are used to every day. So a third eye is coming and finding out and giving you opportunities for improvement, which you couldn't hide it because your eyes are addicted every day within the same kind of environment and same kind of uh, regular routines, you know. So a third eye will definitely give you more better picture. Either your system compliance is good you are following all the systematic requirements or there are some chances of improvement. Yes, you're absolutely right, A, B. They will definitely, the auditors always try to redirect your focus from digging at the right area by showing you their achievement. Absolutely right. But remember, as an auditor, later on, we are also going to prepare audit report. And in the audit report, we can't discuss anything, we can't write anything without evidence, without any reference, you know. If we're gonna say, oh, this is the observation. So we have to prove which document we verified, on which date, which time, and what particular process we, we are referring to this NCR or kind of observation or opportunity for improvement. So as an auditor, we are also bound to prove through objective evidences that our observations or our NCRs, whatever we highlighted, are true in spirit. Because in the closing meeting, anyone can challenge, you know, of any of your observation or NCR. And they're gonna say, look, you highlighted something, but it's already improved. So please remove this NCR, remove this observation. So Expect a lot of debate, especially in the closing meeting. Whenever I conduct an audit, especially as a third party auditor, because I'm the lead auditor for ISO 45001, 14001, and 9001. So whenever we go for those audits, in the closing meeting, you know, very few meetings are there where we don't get any debate. Oh, please, during the eight hours, during the audit, we have improved a lot of things. So please remove these observations. But all such manners, you have to decide in the opening meeting, actually, how you will. Like in the opening meeting, if it is agreed that you will accept the closing remarks or kind of closing actions of uh, different NCRs or observations, and you can collect the evidence in the closing meeting or before the closing meeting, all these things have to be mutually agreed and also it must comply the auditing standards you are following as an auditor. So uh, sometimes the critical situation, you know, one of the uh, one of the managing director or the owner of the business, 
uh, you know, he started giving me a lot of threats also. If you will report something negative about our company, it would not be good for you. So now it's up to you. You have control of your nerves. You are the bold enough for how you're going to tackle such kind of uh, terrible mind, you know. And how are you going to convince them you are there to give them opportunities for further improvement? So that means the auditor have to be bold enough, a person with a strong decision-making abilities, a person who is uh, dead honest all the time, and he'll not compromise, and a person having convincing power to convince the management of that company, look, I'm here to support, to find out the areas for further improvement. And if honor is uh, having some commitment, positive commitment, he will by himself going to say to the auditor, please, I want you to highlight all the gaps, whatever you observe. And that would be a great help. You know, the owner would be saying to the auditor, sometimes that kind of commitment also we observed in the market. But yes, very few. But yes, they are there. And that is why they are more successful. That is why they have global presence. You tell the name of any brand, and I will prove that they are more successful because of their solid system in place. Take example of McDonald's, Starbucks, take example of BSI, ISO, all global brands, even WHO, including your Sadara, Saudi Aramco. You just, uh, you know, talk about any name, any brand, and the foundation would be effective system in place and being followed and respected. And the auditors, they are also supporting and reporting honestly all the observations or opportunities for improvement and they don't hide, they don't take gifts, they don't take under table bribes. Because sometimes, you know, the company is very much reluctant to uh, share or to have something negative within the audit report. Because later on, they are supposed to share this audit report with their uh, clients, with other stakeholders. So they don't want to share anything negative about their business. That is the sensitive part, you know. That is why they put more pressure on auditors. Please don't share, don't report anything negative. Or they'll put pressure, we'll correct before the closing meeting. Now it is up to you how, what criteria you have agreed as per your standards or, you know, as per international standards of auditing. Because after all, as an auditor, you also have certain standards to be followed. So I hope it will help you to understand. Sometimes people take audit a negative uh, event, and sometimes they take it very positive, and it's kind of a learning opportunity for them also, because a third eye is coming and highlighting all the gaps, you know, within their system and true picture of their system also. Even though it's a sample base. It's kind of a sampling audit. The real true picture, uh, the magnitude might uh, can't be highlighted, but still the auditor, the good auditor, still will highlight a lot of opportunities for improvement. Depends on us. We want to take all these opportunities positively, or we think these are threats for our business. Because mostly companies' tendency is just to get the certificate, especially for the third-party audits. Now, during the audit, what we have to do, typical records documents examined during an audit, we can check audit the policy. We can check either the policy is prepared in line with the standard, whichever standard you benchmark and going to audit. Risk assessments and safe systems of work is in place. Training records, minutes of safety committee meetings, and maintenance records and details of failures, records of health and safety monitoring activities like tours. And also monitoring activities like tours, inspection and service, accident investigation reports, data including near miss reporting. So some of these uh, type of data which you can verify like 
emergency arrangements, inspection reports from the insurance companies, output from the regular visits, regulator visits like visit reports, enforcement actions, and records of worker complaints. Several companies, you will notice they have complaint box, they have employees feedback boxes, well displayed at the entrance point, you know, because sometimes people feel hesitation or shyness or some kind of fears also not to report anything negative. So we place uh, uh, complaint boxes or feedback boxes, but I, uh, I always encourage the companies, put them in hidden areas because still people don't want to show that they have put something in the complaint box, especially our employees, you know. So if you want to place a complaint box, make sure it is not in the visible areas, it should be in hidden areas and all employees must be familiar that nobody can watch them what they are putting inside or even ask them, you know. So at the end of the audit, you need to hold a close up meeting followed with a written report. Now how to write an audit report is another skill a detailed pattern, what exactly we have to write in the report. It is the responsibility of management. But remember in the audit report, you will start with positivity. What positive things you have noted in that particular department or even in a company, you know. So your report, audit report must start with positive insights. And then you move on with some sort of opportunities for improvement or kind of observations. And ultimately at the end, you highlight minor or major NCRs. Now it is the responsibility of the management at all levels to ensure recommendations for improvement are communicated and also implemented. Now, audit may be necessary for certification like ISO 45001. Some companies, you know, they don't go for third party certification but they use the structure of the standard like ISO 45001. What they're gonna do, they will purchase or they'll get a standard from anywhere, from different sources, and they will start implementing these standards within their organization willingly, not to get only the piece of paper or a kind of certificate. But yes, once they're ready and they believe they're getting a lot of benefit of that uh, system, but through this standard, then they will call to any certification body, you know, agreeing a cost price with them and they'll audit. And since everything is well, because already implemented, so they'll get globally recognized third party certification of that uh, standard for their business, for their company even. Now let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of an external and internal audit. So let's discuss one by one in the chat box, advantages of external audit. Let's discuss in steps, advantages of external audit. What are the advantages guys? Whatever you believe are the benefits, just highlight in the chat box. So let's learn from each other, inshallah. Okay, so Mr. Muhammad al Gamdi Mashallah, he highlighted open your eyes on things and requirements that may be missing. Excellent, Mashallah. Any other benefit, please? Any other opinion? Benefits of external audits?
Yes, any other opinion, please. Whatever is coming in your mind, just type in the chat box so we would have no biases. Okay. That means the third eye, the neutral eye, no discrimination, no friendship. No unfair support to each other. And most importantly, these external audits will enhance the credibility or goodwill of your business. You know, if your system is an ideal system and, you know, so the auditing company, of course, uh, if they are the second party auditors, they will share this report with the customer. And this customer might share this report to other customers also, because sometimes you never know how brands are collaborate, you know, collaborative partners at one point and uh, might be the company doesn't know, but that report is going to be shared with several other brands. And it will help them to dig out and find out the right supplier for them. And this is how all the shareholders also get confidence, like why Sadara is more successful. Because, mashallah, your auditing reports, your third party audits, your second party audits, your even internal audits, your uh, regulatory audits from the government side, even your customer relevant audits, all are giving a positive picture about Sadara brand, mashallah. And this is how your brand is more published in the market. Evidently, you know, because with evidence, I would say. And no harm to share here that the external audit definitely will give us a lot of uh, areas to improve if the auditor is good. Remember my words, if the auditor is good, or in other words, is the highly competent auditor, definitely you will get a comprehensive picture of your system you know because the good auditor will not only focus on the numbers he will surely try to understand you know very meaningful understanding of your business overall system and will give you a true picture by highlighting some gaps or observations or minor injury or minor ncrs or major ncrs and this is how you will get uh, more better opportunity to improve further. Like Mr. Abdulaziz mentioned, no biases. That means he, he have no threat, no fear, no friendship. So he, he will not discriminate, you know. You all are equally important, equally respectable for him. So he will report without bias. Excellent, mashallah. Now, what are the disadvantages of external audit? Disadvantages of in external audits. Yes, guys, so whatever is coming on your mind, please uh, feel free to share disadvantages of external audit. <clears throat> Okay.
Excellent, Mr. Gamji. This confidentiality or you know sharing of sensitive information about your business, even though in the agreement with that certification body or the auditing body, you will surely sign this statement of confidentiality statement and the terms within the agreement even. But still. There is no guarantee that they will never share your secrets to anyone else. And I totally agree, Mr. A.B., you know, maybe they will not understand the company work process so that the audit will take longer time. And time is very limited to the both parties even because the audit is time bound. Mostly the external audit is time bound. That is why we ask the audit plan from the third party auditors with the time frame, which department uh, exactly at what time they are going to audit, even what things you're going to check within that department. We ask a very detailed audit plan from them so that we can uh, get prepared and make sure the relevant persons are available. Otherwise, this is another disadvantage. You are making time bound, but some of your relevant department heads, they are not available and they are giving excuse. So rescheduling of audit still is another headache. And also it's a cost. It's a cost for the third party certification body if uh, they hired a freelance auditor and they are paying suppose 5,000 real per day. Then if uh, you require two more days, that means 10,000 more real. So Certification body, they don't want to increase that cost, you know. And sometimes we do intentionally make sure, you know, some of our uh, department heads, they are not available. So the audit can be wrapped up as quick as possible. And yes, I totally agree the language barrier and the vocabulary used. Totally agree, you know, this language barrier is so much critical. That is why uh, some auditors, uh, they have translator with them. Or they'll find locally. And you'll be surprised, there are plenty of international standards. It's really hard to find the qualified auditor for that particular standard even. And if someone is competent and approved by the relevant authorities, he is uh, enjoying the career globally, you know, like visiting different countries and performing audits because the market have no other option except him, you know, for that particular standard. So this is another career advantage. If you want to be an auditor, select a standard where you have very less auditor in the market. Like in one of my training, I went to UK and the standard was, uh, you know, for a certification. And I still remember I was the only one in Saudi Arabia, even in, at some level in Middle East level, the only person working as a consultant, as an auditor for that particular standard, because nobody else is available within Middle East. And if you call someone from America, from UK, from Europe, it's terrible cost, you know. So the companies, they gave me opportunity, okay, we gonna send you to UK, you get trained and be the approved auditor, even consultant in future. And for that project, uh, you know, one of uh, uh, McDonald's USA official called me to Dubai just to share this uh, uh, success case study of that project, you know. And all their Middle East supplies were there. So what I mean is sometimes you select a particular standard where very less auditors are available in the market. And that's also secure your career and make you indispensable, I would say. If you want to be a global auditor, then go with a standard where you don't find, but that standard is also important for several industries. Like this forest management standard are very much important for paper industries, for pulp industry, for 
paper cups manufacturing industries for different kind of paper industries so it's linked with several industries so that means you will definitely get plenty of opportunities that is why i got a lot of uh, consulting projects into that area but to do it tomorrow of course uh, market will get more options we call it monopoly also now let's see as per nibosh what are the advantages and disadvantages for external audit they are giving like is independent that means no bias of any internal influence fresh pair of eyes may have wider experience of different type of workplaces and recommendations offer carry more weight and the disadvantage is expensive time consuming may not understand the business so make uh, impractical suggestions like a b mentioned mashallah mm -hmm. may intimidate workers to get incomplete evidence now internal audits also have some advantages and disadvantages like one of the dis, uh, one of the advantages is less expensive auditors already know the business so that what can be realistically achieved improves ownership of uh, issues found and builds competence internally disadvantages auditors may not notice certain issues auditors may not have good knowledge of industry or legal standards auditors may not possess auditing skill so may need training auditors are not independent so may be subject to internal influence so these are some of the disadvantages of internal auditors so now we are going to discuss 4.4 that is all about reviewing health and safety performance what things we need to verify so we can have a clear picture of a health and safety performance or any sort of system now let's understand the purpose of uh, regular reviews we required a full management system review by the board at least annually and also we can have a management review meeting uh, might be quarterly or or at least annually it must also be done face to full review we can review the whole system like all policies procedures format any sort of regulations kind of uh, rules and regulations area wise several type of systems we can review even we can evaluate the data and data can be presented in shape of presentations in front of uh, the top management otherwise we can also rely on departmental review like monthly by line manager to ensure on track assessing opportunities for improvement and the need for change uh, mr sia you have uh, you have okay guys no is it okay please i just disconnected and reconnected so now i hope uh, it would be okay so the purpose of regular views we have full management system review that could be done by the board members or you know uh, at least annually otherwise management team review might be quarterly pay to the full review and also departmental review which can be done by the line manager to ensure on track assessing opportunities for improvement and need for change now reviewing performance is an essential part of any health and safety management system are we on target we have to evaluate again and again over and over and see we are right on target if not why not we have to evaluate what do we have to change actually if our performance safety system performance is going down 
like i shared yesterday if accident graph injuries graph all negative segments even absenteeism if those negative segments of the business going up and up that means our something drastically we need to change within our system our system is not on track that is why we are not getting the right set of benefits same way we have to aim to reduce lost time accidents by 5% target has been met set a new target of another 5% for the next year so our kpis our objectives must be measurable in nature that is why the word smart is important before you decide or select or define even your objectives relevant to safety quality health environment csr even corporate social responsibility whatever kpis you are or objectives you are making make sure they are measurable and must be realistic also you know now we have a group exercise what active and reactive measurements of health and safety performance will need to be reviewed and active and reactive measurements of health and safety performance would need to be reviewed same way like we have active monitoring and we have reactive monitoring so here we are talking about active measurements like proactive measurements and on the other side reactive measurements of health and safety performance so these are some of the things which we truly have to review like legal compliance as a martial arts safety technician that is also your major responsibility to comply and to verify we are uh, meeting all the legal requirements so legal compliance is there for every activity for every process all materials building wherever in whichever area we are we are following even local legal standards as well as the relevant customer standards or international standards or are being compliant for that particular project no accident and incident data can also be evaluated we can have inspection surveys stored and sampling we can verify absence and sickness data audit reports achievement of objectives enforcement actions previous management reviews legal and best practices developments you know so even i would add audit reports mean internal audit reports second party audit reports and third party audit reports audit reports means all three segments we have to review so uh, even you can add in that agenda maybe the moc the management of changes or any major changes are going to be happen or already you have some uh, drastic changes within your company which need to be reviewed in the management review meeting or the issues relevant to those changes that is why the moc the procedure of uh, management of change must also be reviewed and why we do management reviews because ultimately we have to bring up the decision or kind of action plan time bound so that we can improve we can improve our safety system in line with our expectations of our, our customers and legal regulatory bodies including our top management and we can't create or develop or establish our improvement plan until we review until we review all the required or relevant data or kind of procedures or overall system then we can move on with our better planning how to improve that is why the output from the review must be records of the review should be maintained demonstrate compliance with mhsr results may have to be reported to shareholders the aim is continual improvement like senior managers review performance and set targets for the organization middle managers they have to review performance and set targets for their departments and junior managers review local performance and set targets for their local area now i'm sharing one experience with all of you in one of the company i personally was working like all ayan group of companies i was working as a qhsc manager but 
the kpis which were given allocated to the general manager of the company i can't quote the name of that company because all i am have so many companies but for that one company whatever kpis were given to general manager i was achieving them but nobody knows nobody knows that the kpis whatever given to the general managers are being achieved by ishtiagran because i was the one performing everything preparing doing several meetings department wise and he never chaired even a single meeting but later on when the annual performance review came in then in the review report i mentioned i've been doing this 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 and everybody surprised and there was a huge question mark uh, for that general manager how come you were not involved you didn't sit in any management review meeting no safety meetings no site visit always sitting in your office so through that report god forbid you know he he got even i was on a positive ground i was just working because i am a very passionate hard working guy so for me work is not a problem even more responsibilities mean i'll be more energetic because more opportunities for learning or development even you know but from that day i realized first of all whatever kpis you agreed make sure they are well achieved and then see if you can support others also because now the international standard says support and operation clause number 7 and 8 of all the international standards it talks about support and operation that means all operational excellence or uh, you know departmental positive coordination must be there but what was the drawback the drawback was i was deserving maybe salary 35000 real per month but i was getting 15000 real per month so that was the that was the outcome if i could have tell to the board members look i am these are my kpis you gave me uh, 10 kpis but but i am performing 15 kpis i am achieving 15 kpis more that means total 25 kpis so in that scenario i would have claimed maybe much better package you know because since i didn't share with them i was thinking you know the general manager he will be reporting every day so it's all okay so this is another lesson sometime we get in the industries whatever we are performing let the top management be familiar that how you are adding value to their business otherwise no promotions no increments i hope it will help you to grow your career accordingly inshallah but yes on positive grounds we accept extra responsibilities but we negotiate our package also i repeat again no harm to if you have a strong leadership skills accept more responsibilities because you can manage that is your confidence mashallah or your competence level but what i mean is if you are accepting more responsibilities then sit on the table and have negotiation you know of your package i am ready to perform those activities or responsibilities but now this is my demand you know otherwise if you will not negotiate no demands and you are expecting that something fruitful would happen for you no way and later on you have only one option to either to repent or to be happy at least you learned a lot like in my case i was still happy because i learned a lot i learned a lot to work as a general manager like as a general manager of uh, hsc it's more easier for me because i can define the objectives in line with the business goals and it's more easier for me to tackle to the customer compliance to the legal compliance and meeting all the requirements and leading to the team internal as a trainer as a auditor so more flexibility for the company to utilize me as a hsc manager or as, as a hsc general manager 
and several companies have director position, even GM, QHSC, uh, even now business excellence manager, one more position is being retained. You know. So a lot of opportunities. If you have agreed some individual KPIs, that is your foundational cornerstone you have to achieve. And additional all KPIs, negotiate. Negotiate your package, and this is your right also. I hope it will help you to boost up your career, inshallah, because ultimately everybody have right to grow. And especially the financial freedom is the foundational need of all human beings. Everybody want financial independence. Then he can or oh, you know give better output he can be more productive because once he's happy and financially independent trust me he'll be more qualitative and productive all the way whatever job you have given him but if he is facing financial issues or financial terrible stresses are there then of course you know the performance will go down that is why uh, to make our employees financially sound we have to do justice actually, as per their performance, as per. Otherwise, on positive ground, learning is the best opportunity. The more responsibilities you are accepting, the more learning opportunities you are getting. Now, what is the aim of continual improvement? Because ultimately, why we are reviewing our system? Because we want to improve further. We want to improve more and more. That is the aim of continual improvement. Now, senior manager review performance and set targets for the organization. That is their job. Middle managers review performance and set targets for their departments. And junior managers review local performance and set targets for their local area. So that is uh, the summary of uh, element three, like outline the difference between active and reactive monitoring. We discussed all the parameters of active and reactive monitoring but remember for active approach means active monitoring and reactive approach means reactive monitoring so we have to be proactive because prevention is better than cure and also we discuss about the purpose and the procedures for investigating incidents and the requirements for recording and reporting consider the reasons for accident investigation and most importantly we also describe Anybody knows what is R-I-D-D-O-R stand for? Any one of you, please. Can you mention the chat box? Have you ever heard this word? Anybody remember all six important words or the abbreviation of Any one of you, even you have opportunity to research, Google up, but let me see if you can get the right abbreviation, you know. And why we use this tool actually? And can we find these regulations like Masjana Mr. Muhammad Al Gamdi mentioned clearly, the reporting of injuries, diseases, dangerous circles and regulations. Now can we find these regulations from HSC UK website? Might be I will share that link also, but still if you can get a few minutes and find out those regulations like reporting of injuries, diseases, dangerous circles and regulations. And you know, we can make our habit, whatever we are studying in the presentation, we can find the reference. It is mentioned somewhere in which regulation, HSE UK, OSHA, ILO, where these things are. Like if, if you're talking about active and reactive monitoring, which regulation is relevant to that? Can we find the reference? I hope you got the point. So whatever we are studying here, we can find out based on which standard it is helping us to understand and improve further. Excellent, Marshall. And also we discuss about the purpose of uh, the procedures and health and safety auditing. 
We also discussed the, explain the purpose of the procedures for regular review of uh, health and safety performance. Yes, uh, excellent, mashallah, Muhammad al -Ghamdi. It is mentioned there in UK health and safety legislation. And this also applies to all responsible person and require them to correctly report and keep a record of certain injuries and incidents that happen at work. But remember, we discussed how to convince our employees to report. Because every brain is different, you know. How are you going to convince them to report? not to hide any sort of uh, near misses or minor or major injuries or any sort of incident even, how are we going to convince them to report? And here, we have to be the mind changer. We have some convincing power. We must have some effective communication. We must be emotionally intelligent. We must be like a psychiatrist to understand people and deal them accordingly. And we must be fully knowledgeable, familiar with the systematic requirements so we can teach people, we can give them better insights how they have to report and why reporting is important. Let me share one of the incident, or not incident, the data analysis from Saudi Aramco. Even after having 82 years experience, still they are suffering for reporting. Even in one of the theory they mentioned, you know, the employees, they don't know what is reporting is all about or how to report. Even they don't know what to report. Even most of them don't have idea how to call 911 and what to say. How to report an incident and what information they have to share. They don't know. Even, even in one of the theory they mentioned, they don't know what is an emergency. <laughs> So those lessons are definitely giving them some challenges, how to convince, especially their subcontractors or contractors. Like I mentioned earlier, Sadara employees, direct employees, you guys are excellent all the way, mashallah. But what about your subcontracting employees or your subcontractors, you know, how they are reacting on site and what level of control you have on them, you know, because mostly, uh, Sorry to say, I'm sharing, I'm a very straightforward person <laughs> and I'm sharing the life stories. You know, mostly in Saudi Arabia, especially, 99% business is based on relationships. And if I'm hiring some contractors based on relationship, they will damn care mostly about quality, safety, health, you know, complying with, or having some positive, energy to maintain our brand goodwill because they know the procurement manager is my friend. They know the director of Sadara is my friend. So I don't need to worry about. And sometimes under table commission deals already are there. The more commission you are giving, more contracts you are having. So then forget about quality or credibility or even safety. Because you wrapped up the process and you created something negative and people simply damn get if you are accepting bribery and you know, or kind of a hidden commission and hiring a contract, a contractor, then you compromise, you compromise already with safety, quality and credibility. Because your brand, you are the one going to maintain the credibility in the market. Even. Even I noted personally, I'm sharing with all of you, if an HR manager is hiring some employees through recruitment companies, and the recruitment companies, they are also getting some amount from the employee, what they're gonna say to them, okay, we will find a job for you on behalf of us, you, serve to Sadara projects and Sadara will pay us, let's take an example of 300 Saudi Riyal per hour. 
and you know because you are going to invite to sadara but the employee you agreed with him 100 real per hour so the remaining 200 real you can't get that project if you don't pay something to the hr manager of that particular company while in sadara why you are more successful might be these bad practices are not there the more such bad practices if you have your brand goodwill is already in danger zone and why you are more successful because very few cases would be there otherwise maybe zero possibility because you must have pre qualification system a lot of team members are involved so no one man show is there who can accept hidden gifts or money or bribery awarding contracts to the subcontractors or contractors what i mean is if a person has already paid you for something no he he will not think about quality or some other things you know because he knows i paid from my share so why should i worry about so this is how sometimes we are killing people we are killing people by compromising with several ethical grounds you know so i hope it will also because today you are working in a certain position might be tomorrow you are going to have strong leadership position because you are the saudi mashallah so the more learning you going to get the more better positions you will have in saudi arabia mashallah so that's why i'm sharing with you the live realities and whenever you become a top leader inshallah coming future so you must be familiar what can happen on ground and i'm sharing live stories practical stories which i have noted even in one of the audit we found invoice and even you know this quotation papers in the drawers of the finance manager and that companies doesn't exist but they are putting invoice they are putting quotations for different things when the top management is sleeping and few of the documents we noted let me share uh, might be it will help in future if suppose the fuel was uh, 20 real they just added one zero they just added one zero and now the same petrol is for 200 real so 180 saudi real cut from the profit from the net profit of that company and the companies the businessman they are very clever if they are getting the profit more and more then they will share accordingly if their profits are being cut because of corruption because of such kind of elements the less the profit is less the facilities less the promotion less the increments i hope you will get that idea why the ethical grounds are so much important for the continual growth of and that is why sadara is so much successful mashallah same way saudi iran because they have corruption free policy even still happening at some level but still they are trying you know through system through uh, a lot of uh, i would say the blocking elements are there within the system so they are trying hard and trust me sometimes i say honesty is the best policy no i started saying honesty is the only policy if you leave honesty your brand today or tomorrow is no more because honesty means the trust value and trust once broken is broken forever that is why if we really want to make sure that everyone within our company have to be responsible and ensure safety quality and credibility this triangle everyone is going to be responsible then we have to be a role model actually ethically honestly if someone knows oh he is a commission agent he always gets commission and award contracts if that vibe will be there within the company trickle down effect is very terrible negative you know and the other people with the weak mindset they will also love to do corruption you know because the leader is doing it 
the leader is corrupt so trickle down effect will be very corrupty i hope you got the point so may allah award you the best highest top management positions in future because it's your country mashallah and i hope uh, you will be a strong ethical leader will not be doing anything which can damage your brand value personally because we have two level of brand value our personal brand value and our company's brand value so i hope the both pillars you will never demolish inshallah thank you very much guys uh, this is all about four element and we will start ig2 tomorrow inshallah but ig2 is all about the risk assessment i repeat again the ig2 like from element 5 to 11 we will just discussing what hazards controls or some kind of precautions but these elements will help us to complete our risk assessment the ig2 project you know risk assessment project because two exams are there the first exam ig1 is based on first element to fourth element which we completed today like ig1 study is completed today only we will have some practical exercises ongoing some understanding but ig2 from tomorrow to onward up to uh, element 11 from 5 to 11 we will just be discussing three words hazards controls and precautions hazards you can add even risk hazards risk controls and precautions so we will discuss this type of triangle 5 to 11 elements and it will help us to complete our ig2 project inshallah thank you very much guys uh, i'm wrapping up today a little bit early the reason is my mother is waiting for me so uh, but the plan is achieved because i was supposed to deliver element 4 today and tomorrow same time even is a weekend like thursday is there so we'll complete inshallah element 5 or maybe element 6 as well take care of yourself thank you very much so any question any query any confusion you can contact me directly or even in whatsapp group you can share and i'll be happy to respond in chat thank you very much yes i will i will share you know just uh, let me little bit free from my mother inshallah so mr muhammad al gambi i'll definitely share don't worry okay so nice of you thank you very much okay bye bye dears